the most common theme I see is the isolation that most of us feel. Most, many, and maybe, you know, not everybody, but many people grew up somehow deciding that it really wasn't okay to ask for help and that we're on our own. We have to figure this stuff out and we can't ask anybody. And that I see that in clients' dreams and I saw it in my own dreams, how hard it was to reach out and ask for help. Welcome to the Optimum Human Podcast, the show that interviews the world's top experts in fitness, nutrition, mindset, and beyond. Let's get into the show. Hey guys, this episode of the Optimum Human Podcast is brought to you by the Savvy Girl's Guide to Organic Beauty. Truth is, lots of women think they're well-informed about personal care products, but they haven't invested the time to truly learn about the toxic ingredients in the products they use every day. The Savvy Girl's Guide to Organic Beauty is a value-packed online course that teaches you how to detox your beauty and personal care routine and look younger without toxic chemicals. This program is brought to you by our guest from the Optimum Human Podcast episode number 38, Kelly Bonanno. If you want a sneak peek into what will be taught in the course, check out episode 38, or you can check out Kelly's free five-day challenge, Five Days to a Clean Green Beauty Routine. Wow, that's a mouthful. This course offers an easy way to get the toxic junk out of your home and away from you and your kids. You'll learn anti-aging tips that will help you to look and feel younger, how to keep your family safe from harmful toxins, easy, actionable tips that will improve your health, how safe the products you and your kids currently use are, wellness secrets that mainstream doctors don't share, how to reduce your body's toxic burden, and which products and brands are truly safe and effective. So you can check the show notes at www.theoptimumhuman.com for all the links to find Kelly's free five-day challenge or to register for the Savvy Girl's Guide to Organic Beauty. We use many of the products Kelly recommends in her program so we can genuinely recommend her knowledge and the products she recommends so you know they are good. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Optimum Human Podcast. My name is Brian McKay, he's Claude Petrulis, and we are your hosts of the Optimum Human Podcast. And Claude, what, what is this show? I think uh, this is the Optimum Human Podcast, and we are the hosts, uh, Brian and Claude, of the Optimum Human Podcast. Uh, we, we, we had our three, and then you added a fourth. Man, come on. Uh, you, you know, uh, yeah, I think I went overboard. I don't think people know what show they're listening to. Um, enough and, about you us. And, you and me go overboard? Never. You go overboard? No, I don't even know what ego means. Too focused on myself to know oh. anything outside of myself. Um, anyway. I'm doing well, Brian. How are you? Good, good. Uh, good. Today we've got another uh, okay, amazing show. guest. Uh, another shit show. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Hopefully our guest can save us from ourselves. Absolutely. Oh, boy. I, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure our guest has some a comment on that as well. Uh, Mrs. Lee Randolph. Lee, how are you today? I'm doing well, thanks. Good, um, good. Bad news is that only you can save you from yourself. <laughs> Oh no, that is bad news. <laughs> uh, the the old Humpty Dumpty theme, I believe. Oh man. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, cool. Only Humpty Dumpty can put himself back together. Well, this is this is going to be an interesting life then. Um <laughs> So, Lee, uh for for those of our listeners who don't know uh, you and your work. Uh, can you give us a, a quick breakdown of uh, who you think you are and what it is that you do to serve the world? A quick breakdown, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let you escape on this one. All right. Well, I came from a really left brain, medically oriented family. So I ended up specializing in endodontics for 25 years, which means that I did root canals. And there was a place where the universe seemed to be calling and made my hands hurt so much that I had to retire because of arthritis in my hands. And now I, I help a lot of folks with both um, scanning the bioenergy of the body and using homeopathics, and I, I explore, help clients explore their dreams 
and to find their way through to places in life and places in our belief systems that, that block us and um, just open us up more to be more optimal humans. How's that? I love the plug. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow, that's uh, quite the background. Um, so yeah. it is. I think for a lot of years I pretended to be left brain so I could feel, feel like I belonged in my family. But I'm I, I'm apparently a lot more right brain than I realized. I've taken up watercolor and have discovered that um, I'm really drawn to it, and it seems to be something that. I'm, I'm learning how to be good at, so. plus yeah. working with the dreams and scanning and you know the intuition and all that comes with all of that. Absolutely. Lee, how was that transition for you? The transition was pretty difficult um, because all the layers of stepping away from um, what I believed was, you know, uh, the, the family container, the family legacy, uh, all the money I spent on getting a dental education. <laughs> I mean, all of those things mm -hmm. made it hard to walk away from what I did, right? my employees, my patients, all of it. And I also felt like I was being called to something else. And um, the dreams are certainly a part of that coaching as well. So I appreciate the question, but I think for all of us, this seems to be a time of transitions for a lot of people mm -hmm. and stepping away from the familiar is hard because it's familiar. I mean, even when we know the familiar might not be functional or healthy for us anymore. And I find that, say, people exploring their dreams or keep stepping deeper and deeper into those transitions. Mm. Yeah, and they can be uncomfortable, like you mentioned. It's it's very interesting because, like you said, you set up like a framework around yourself, and it's essentially like you build a house, you live in it, you decorate it the way you want, and you're like, ah, time to go to a new house. Hmm. So it, it's and hard. Another for part of you says, "What?" Yeah, it starts freaking out. It's the uh, you know, it's like that hierarchy of needs. You know, like you've got what you want. Like don't. Uh, don't uh, don't mess with it too much. And then there's society telling you what to do also, and friends, family. It's it's a lot of um, external influences. So that that's why that's why I think that that question is is important to not only ask other people but to ask ourselves. It's it really helps us reflect on what we did and uh, like I, I found that for myself when when I got into coaching and training, it just I felt like I was in the right place, but everybody around me was like, oh man, come on, it's temporary. Like high school students do that. And I'm like, yeah, but I kind of love it. And I'm kind of cha helping change people's lives. Like it's, um, it's, it's a completely different feeling than what I was doing before. You know? yeah, right. And it's pretty important to be able to hear that voice too, because as you said, we are, we of course we grow up listening to external voices and then at some point in our lives we make those external voices internal voices mm -hmm. and some of them support us and some of them don't definitely absolutely so lee is there um you know hindsight always being 2020 if there's something you could have told yourself or something you could have done to make that transition easier what what do you think that would have been at this point i think about the uh, i you know from my perspective i guess i believe that everything that we go through is necessary for our education uh, but i think i wish i'd gotten out earlier um, of dentistry, not because I stopped loving dentistry, but because I was ignoring the message my body was sending, and I got pretty uncomfortable. Okay. And, and that's like mainly the arthritis, or yes, yeah. No. It was all about the arthritis because I got so it was very. It was a lot of mind over body to even hold a syringe. And, wow. you know, a dental syringe or a mirror doesn't really weigh very much. 
Yeah, but you hold it, uh, you know, hold every day for often. 25 years. Right. Yeah. Wow. Now, and, it, and just, I'm a, I'm a third generation dentist, so there's all that piece of it, too. That, oh, that's a lot of baggage. Yeah, exactly. It's a lot of history there. It's uh, <laughs> kind of like how people's um, dad was a cop and his granddad was a cop. And it's like, it's like, oh, geez, looks like my route is chosen for me. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Free I need to will. Go up and be this. Is yep. there such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I certainly didn't start out that way. I mean, I I tried moving away from it, and I felt really called to it. So. Hmm. Cool. So the uh, the homeopathy was that you kind of found that due to your own need. Um, that's a great question. Actually, can we, can, sorry, but before uh, we start, can we define homeopathy for, for listeners? Because I, I know people get confused, naturopathy, homeopathy, like all, there, there's a bunch of different uh, things going going around right now. A bunch there's of pathies. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And there's different um, definitions, too. Some people, um, have, they, they kind of corrupt terms, so. Well, um, the, the homeo or homo is... I don't even know if it's Greek or Latin, but it means same. So it, it, it is based upon what's called the law of similars. And the German physician who came up with the notion thought in the mid-late 1800s that if he could find plants that in, in, uh, when given to patients, if they duplicated the symptoms that the patient was having, the symptoms would disappear. So it's it's like sound waves that when you um, oppose, bring two sound waves together that are exactly the same frequency, you'll, they cancel each other out. And mm. he and a small group of people did their version of research at that time, and they were the patients. So um, they discovered the, the plants and they made the mixtures and then when they realized that it did work he started trying to make tinctures to see how that would work so he would cut it in half and it would still work and then he would cut it in half again and it would still work and now you can buy homeopathic dilutions that are like one to sixty thousand and they work Uh, which is pretty amazing but it is the evidence that we really are vibrational beings so that's mm. that is where homeopathy homeop- okay, homeopathy <laughs> developed from, um, and and there it's it's used. There are homeopathic physicians who are working with um, homeopathic. I don't even want to call them drugs, but dilutions to help cure cancer. So they're they're re- really potent. You can't go to Whole Foods and buy those, but um, thank God you know, there's a lot. Yeah, really. Yeah, there, there's a lot available. Well, the other piece of it, though, with the stuff you can buy, if you take something that isn't going to help you, it'll just sort of move right through you. Mm. Um, so I find it to be very interesting. But I, uh, I even when I was practicing dentistry, I became a lot more interested in recommending supplements to patients instead of pharmaceuticals. I tried to really limit pharmaceuticals because, you know, we, this whole group of people listening to you guys know that, you know, antibiotics aren't really good for us. And, and if we can avoid a lot of pain medications, we're better off. So um, I went in that direction and began discovering homeopathics mm. uh, that long ago. Is, is there a, a particular one that might help uh, in place of a, let's say, a, a narcotic pain medication for, you know, after a, an extraction or something? A t- tooth extraction, to, to clarify. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I didn't do that. So um, I think probably the one people know the best is Arnica. Okay. Um, there are others that are good anti-inflammatories, but please don't ask me to list them. <laughs> um, <laughs> because there are a lot that are mixtures. Um we use one here that's like magic. It's called Wounds Recovery, and it's the, the uh, manufacturer is uh, King Bio out of North Carolina, and it really is magic. You can spray it on a cut or a sprain, and 
it's pretty amazing what it does. Wow. Very cool. Sir, sir, what was the name of that again? It's called Wounds Recovery. You you can't buy it. You can't. I've never seen it in the store. I don't think anybody. I don't oh, you get it. Get it online. Detail. You can go onto the website um, and buy it through them. I believe. Yeah. And I don't was, think you have to be a distributor of it. But. It was it was King. Um, King the, Bio. King Bio. B I O. That's the name. Let's see. <laughs> well, the other the. the that's the the name of the business. These okay. homeopathics are called Safe Care RX. Um, All right. Well, I'll I'll put them online for people that yeah. uh, want to find them. Uh, and then, I mean, the ones we we sell those here, and we also have the ones from New Human, which are connected with the uh, the scanner. And we use one called Inflame Care that also is pretty magical. Hmm. Awesome. And, and, and New people Human is also sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, pe people always think um, that inflammation is generally like a bad thing, though. But we, we actually need a little bit of it, right? Well, I, I think it's certainly a signal to the body that there's something going on. Um, mm -hmm. You you might... I, I'm not sure what you mean when you say we need a little bit of it. Well, let's say like when we're injured or when we're... Um, you know, when, when we have something wrong with our body, it kind of helps send blood to the area and it kind of helps trigger a bunch of reactions. But the, the problem is when there's too much or like chronic inflammation, I, I think, because people. Right. Yeah. People always assume, oh, inflammation, bad, bad, bad. And then they're like on like anti-inflammatories for like a year or two. And it's like, oh, like my, my liver is failing. It's like, oh, OK. So. Yeah, I'm not saying like natural supplements will do that, but a little bit of inflammation is okay. But if you've got chronic inflammation, that's then it's time to go see someone. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you stub your toe and the body doesn't have any kind of inflammatory response, you can literally lose your toe. So, uh, yeah. That's true. Uh, that right. doesn't sound like fun to me. No. But right. You can play hide and go seek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. So begins the descent into madness. <laughs> right. Yes. So, Lee, can you uh, pull us out? Uh, let's, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, wow. Well, I'll go from my, my dental background, and, and I talk to, to people a lot about the inflammatory aspects of sugar. Oh, sugar. Let's, let's talk about sugar. Yeah. I mean, so in that way when there's a lot of chronic inflammation i ask people to start looking at their diet mm. and generally sugar is a good good place to look and wheat flour stuff like that it's uh, i i think because we didn't evolve on it um it's a, like a huge shock to our body and it essentially acts like a toxin i've heard so yeah yeah there's uh it's good reason to give up sugar, at least uh, like 99% of it. Right, Brian? Absolutely. Especially if you're a dentist. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like the company line. Well, kind of, yeah. Yeah, my receptionist used to say, oh, yeah, I heard you in there giving the sugar lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about well, right. Yeah, it's not a bad lecture to... Uh, to give to receive I, I bet people are like yeah yeah i know it's like right well yeah. what's the number one lie told it's yes i floss every day yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh yeah so let's uh let's get into into some of this dream stuff lee let's uh i mean can you kind of give a a an overview of your take on on people's dreams, if I can be as vague as, as that. <laughs> Brian wants to know why he's so dreamy. I think that's the question he's, yes, he's yes. trying to get at. Well, we all dream. There will be lots of people you encounter who say, I don't dream. Um, I'm one of them. Do. Yeah, we all dream. Actually, the, the science is that we all dream four to five times a night when we go into REM sleep. Now, recalling dreams is a whole different issue. Mm -hmm. um, and from my place, dreams come to us out of the unconscious, the subconscious, and maybe something that's a little past that, that to 
bring us things we need to look at in our life to help us be more optimal humans. Um, so it, it's looking at a lot of the old beliefs that we carry that that we made about life, beliefs we, we decided on when we were so little that we don't even know what they are. We just have a framework of what we think life is about and don't, don't know that it's based on really, really old ideas. So the dreams will bring those to us. And similarly uh, to homeopathy as far as dilutions, it's usually not, you know, coming in, hitting you over the head with a hammer, although that can happen <laughs> um, in a dream. But it's usually repeated themes that we be, that, that we begin to see in our dreams. And, and it, it is the gift of keeping a journal because then it's, it just, it has a lot more impact when you start to see in a dream, you know, over and over again, the same kind of issue coming up so that's a big piece of it for me that we I, I mean my whole life has changed over the years I've been doing dream work with my mentor um, I have I'm a lot more in touch with the energy of my life I'm a lot more in touch with um, for me how shame has run my life and and the things that, I mean the reason I'm I'm painting these days is because of dream after dream after dream telling me to go pick up paints. Mm, nice. So I, I, all of those kinds of gifts, I think, are available for all of us. And how we hide from our anger, how we hide from our shame, how we hide from feelings in general. Because we, we don't live in a culture that encourages us to feel. We do live in a culture that encourages us to think. It's very true. It's very true. And to sit in a room alone by ourselves or with our thoughts uh, is a terrifying for most people. They won't admit it, but the, it's they're not going to do it either. Oh, I'm too busy. You know, it's like, uh, no, you're not. You're just watching CNN. Right. Or, or even uh, in a, I remember a therapist several years ago suggested that I uh, turn off the radio in the car and just sit with my my own thoughts and my God, that was really difficult at that time. It's still not the easiest thing some days. Some days, <laughs> some days I actually enjoy it. But uh, wow, just to uh, sit and, and be with yourself. Yeah, it sounds like painting can kind of be used as like meditation. Um, I, yes, it can be. <laughs> kind of. I mean, well, I think it's a whole range of things. Yes, mm -hmm. it is, it's contemplative. And it's also focused, and it's it also is connecting with um, a creative muse that is there for all of us. I mean, I think it's really important that we understand as humans that that being creative is essential, and most of us don't believe that. Mm. And so, yeah, and, you know, we all have our electronic leashes these days that make it even harder for us to be really alone, which is a really big, different thing for me than being lonely. Mm -hmm. mm. Absolutely. So, yeah. do, do you do any kind of, um, I hate to use the term, but art therapy with either yourself or, or your clients? I do. Okay. I do. I find that um, it, there are lots of ways to use art and dreams. Um, it, it can be stick figures expressing an event in a dream. It can be sitting down with paints or inks to express the feeling of a dream. It, anything works. I mean, taking colored pencils or crayons and just putting color on a page to express what part of a dream felt like um, somehow lets it lets it move into and through our bodies in a very different way. Mm. Yeah, like 
I, I, I used to draw and I, I found it. Um, I wasn't very good at it, but I, I found each time I, I did it, it calmed me down. It like, um, I, I can't even exp- explain like the effect it had on me, but it was like, it was kind of awesome. And then I stopped and uh, it never really got that feeling back. So this is going to make me draw again, guys. Awesome. Yay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to send Dr- Brian all sorts of <laughs> pictures. <laughs> Oh, Grade God. seven on the desk pictures. Right, I'm just waiting, waiting for those. <laughs> oh man, M- it's always, always refrigerator magnets, you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God you uh, live alone, Claude. <laughs> well, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> thank the universe. I think it's better for me that way too. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, getting back in, into the day. <laughs> Yeah, just getting back on track. <laughs> right. Uh, getting back into the dreams, is there some kind of overarching themes that, that you've seen throughout doing your own dream work as well as your clients that kind of um, run throughout? Um, for everybody, uh, I, I yeah, it's probably a little bit too much overarching. Other than, I, I would guess the most... The most common theme I see is the isolation that most of us feel. Most, many, and maybe, you know, not everybody, but many people grew up somehow deciding that it really wasn't okay to ask for help and that we're on our own. We have to figure this stuff out and we can't ask anybody. And that I see that in clients' dreams, and I saw it in my own dreams, how hard it was to reach out and ask for help. That when someone shows up in a dream who is willing to help, you have to ask. And and uh, so I'd call that probably one of the major things of how isolated we are, or how isolated we feel, anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my own, even not having a voice, um, I was in a difficult marriage for almost three decades and I completely lost my ability to speak for myself. And I didn't know it because those sorts of things happen over time. And that came up in the dreams over and over and over again until I found my voice again. And I'm still working on that. I'm still learning about that. Absolutely. Now I, I'm curious, does, does that show up literally in the dreams? Like let's say, uh, something bad's going to happen and you go to, you know, scream in, in fear and, and nothing comes out in the dream or, or is it a little bit more uh, metaphorical? Um, that can happen and has happened in my dreams. The other piece will be over and over again, um, someone coming up to me and saying something and I just nod my head and I don't, I don't engage in conversation or I didn't. I will now in my dreams, but um, so just just not not interacting with people verbally, just standing on the sidelines and nodding or smiling, and that was all I would do for years. Mm. Now, speaking about dreams, I'm I'm one of those people that dreams like once, well, remembers their dreams once every three months. Now, is that just a physical thing, like the way that I sleep, or is it a uh, the dreams are too horrible to remember thing, or but what's what's your experience been with that, those, Lee? Um, I I don't know that it has to do with the difficulty of dreams. I think part of it is how much attention we pay, and again, the science is that if we don't write down a dream within ninety seconds of waking up, it's gone. And while most of us have some dreams that just stay with us for years even, most of our dreams we don't, we just don't hang on to. And so it's my first recommendation is just having paper and pen next to the bed so that when you wake up you can jot down some notes. Um, I've been working with like teenagers. If you're 18, you'll remember four or five dreams a night and every single detail, but somewhere after 18, that ability seems to kind of fade away. Mm-hmm. Interesting. A- a- any theories on that or? Oh, I just think our, no, I think our brains are different when we're 18 than they are when they're 
35 or 40, plus we have a lot more going on in life. You know, you wake up and think, oh, I didn't do whatever, or I need to, or mm. um, the, the pressures of life take over, of waking life anyway. Because for me, like I recently had a dream that there was like a meteor and it was approaching Earth and stuff and it was like a giant fireball. But that's like the last dream I can actually recall like in the last, I don't know, like six months or so. It's like when I go to sleep, it's like just turning off your computer and then I wake up and it's like turning it back on. It's like there's I'm, I'm even in the same position. So it's like I just am I, am I a robot, Lee? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> well, but but you know what? When you turn your computer back on, there are all those emails waiting for you anyway, even though it was off. That's true. That so is... it's, yeah, it's setting the intention that you'd like to remember dreams. I mean, I know people who have been doing their own work for 20 years as far as dreams go, and they'll take one dream to a session because that's what they do, have a dream in two or three weeks. Um, so it the, the work works. It, it's just setting the intention that we actually want to explore our dreams and see what's in them. And so it takes a little bit of um, focus. It does, doesn't change overnight usually. Mm. But even saying before you go to bed at night, I'd like to remember my dreams and setting that intention. And, and it will it will come. Ah, uh, so it might be that I'm I'm not setting the intention. I guess, I guess I've gotten used to uh, just you know turning yeah. off like a computer. It's uh, to me, uh, I, I think I don't know why, but I, I feel like dreams are pesky or like it's almost like too much work. So maybe that's why I don't remember them. Mm, well, that's uh. super interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just like yeah, whatever. It's a dream. And, and and I'd like to offer too that no matter how scary a dream seems, like a meteor, you know, coming at the yeah, earth. That was pretty messed up. Yeah. Well, it's it sounds scary anyway. Um, dreams always come to support us. Mm. So often, a really scary dream has come to help us work through some old trauma that, that, you know, we may may not even recall what it is, but it's to help us work with the feelings of the trauma that we still have held in our body. So mm. the dreams are always there to support us, even when they seem unpleasant. Well, the cool thing about this dream, and if I hijack this podcast again, Brian, kill me, but... Um, <laughs> Don't worry, I'm, is, I'm going to eventually either way. Uh, beautiful. <laughs> it's a karate chop to the neck, and that's it. Uh, <laughs> game over. Um, so I had a cell phone, and I was able to like rewind time like two minutes or like a minute before um, this meteor is supposed to like strike or whatever. And like it was like this almost like a groundhog day thing except like <laughs> this perpetual thing where it's like yeah you can rewind but you've only got like a minute and it's like i think i i might have done that a few times in, in the dream and it was just like and like like shows you that I, I don't know maybe i'm reading too much into it but like it it kind of was more unsettling than if there was just a meteor like hitting like i guess it made me question my priorities who i would call what i would do maybe that was the purpose who the hell knows well, a question I would ask is, do you ever find yourself getting lost in the what-ifs when you're thinking about something? Oh, definitely. That's like my life. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah. I, I would, I, it, it would just be a question, wondering if maybe the dream is suggesting there might be some things you're missing out there because you're so busy thinking about it. Mm. It's true. It's true. Caused me to reflect a little bit. Definitely about loved ones and stuff, so. Cool. Yeah. And then, then my, what was coming up for me was, you know, the uh, the whole savior or hero archetype and, and uh, the role that that might play. Uh, that would be, uh, I don't know if it would be a savior. Cause it's like, oh, rewind, oh crap, it's still there. Oh, rewind, <laughs> oh crap, it's still there. <laughs> But uh, I thought you were going to talk about sex dreams, Brian, because that, that to me is, is fascinating. Nope. <laughs> no, no, you're not going to go there. <laughs> not going to go there. But uh, actually, I, I, I uh, what's that? Too Freudian for you? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so tell me more about your mother. <laughs> uh, no. 
<laughs> Sorry, Brian, you're, you're going somewhere until I, I freuded you. Yes. So just to give, give our listeners a little bit of background on this. So uh, Lee's life partner is John McMullen, who we've had on this podcast before. Um, I can't remember which episode that was, but go and check that out. That was fantastic. Uh, and John invited uh, me and Claude down for one of the intensives, and I ended up going. Um, I showed up the, American. the night before. Uh, and got to meet in person J.P. Sears. And so that morning, I, when I woke up, I, for whatever reason, decided to uh, journal my dream, which I almost never recall. Like, I'm like you in the once every six months. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I recalled this dream, uh, and uh, I actually had Lee kind of give me a uh, a bit of bit of some insight on it and uh so i'm going to share that with our listening audience and i just like to say before that i'm sorry jp <laughs> oh no <laughs> jp sex dream <laughs> i can't even deal with you right now <laughs> so th so this is what i wrote down so i was hanging out with jp <laughs> this is even weirder now that you <laughs> said that <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so I was hanging out with JP when he got that twinkle in his eye, or you don't know whether he's serious or playing when he grabbed a shotgun. I grabbed it from him, and baseball bat swung it at him and hit him in the chest or shoulder. <laughs> he was like, what the fuck was that for? And I told him that I couldn't tell if he was playing or serious. He was also smoking for whatever reason <laughs> and was kind enough to give me a ride back to my car because it was raining. It was in a house high up on a hill with a long long, long set of stairs to get to it. When I think about this dream, it makes me sad that I would hit or beat up such a kind human being because I couldn't tell if he was playing or serious. That's deep, man. Yes. That's like, uh, I don't know. Well, to me, I, I kind of get it because it's like we're, we're primal creatures and if, if we're not sure about someone you know, or like we're, if they're like a, a danger and we can't tell, and yeah, you might be, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to say justified, but it might be the instinct that we have, Maybe. but I'm not the dream expert. So, yes. So, <laughs> we... uh, well, you and I did chat about this Absolutely. and, um, you know, one of the things I would suggest to anybody is knowing that how you feel when you wake up from a dream, you know, partly can come from the dream, but also partly can come from our ego going, you know, crumple that paper up and throw it away. Cause yeah, don't share that with anybody. <laughs> right. No, well, don't even think about it anymore because it's, it means growing and moving away from the familiar. Um, so when someone that I assume you respect a lot, um, like JP shows up in a dream, they're they're often there to represent an archetypal figure who is actually there to help us. Oh, and in that's how he felt in this dream. I mean, not before he picked up the gun. I mean, as far as how you feel about JP. Absolutely. Yes, I, I have a great great deal of respect for JP. Well, he also so, gave him a ride to his car, so that's nice. Right after right. after hitting him. Yeah, geez, that's that's like extra level kindness. I'd be like, Brian, you can walk, bro. <laughs> Don't use me as an archetype because I'll leave you there. Well, and the, the place to go in the dream is that moment when he picks up the gun and what that felt like to you. What happened inside of you when you saw that? Yeah, it was def definitely a lot of fear. Right. I want to know what the gun represents. Well, I'm more interested in the fear. <laughs> Brian, tell us about both. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not even sure what the the gun represents. The the, the fear. I mean, I think there is definitely a lot of fear at that time. Uh, going and, and doing the work at the intensive. Uh, 
and uh, just a, a lot of uncertainty in my life, it, frankly, o over recent months. Right, um, and um, is it is it hard for you to trust men? Yes, that is something I I, I had the realization from from our time down there. Yes. I think that's a big piece of uh, what this dream was opening up is is just opening up to realizing how however that works in you as a defense mechanism that you protect yourself and it looks like from this dream that you may protect yourself even before anything has happened mm -hmm. that it has become reflexive is that sound right to you? Yeah, that, that definitely resonates. Yeah. And I, I'll share this as well. So for the first four days uh, at the, the Journeys of Wisdom intensives, uh, I finished the day with, with working with, with another participant. Uh, and for the first four days, for whatever reason, I, I worked with, with women. And then the uh, last day, I actually ended up working with um, just an amazingly kind-hearted gentleman. This guy is big and scary. <laughs> and uh, it was just kind of interesting having having all of those realizations together. So, Very cool. Very synchronous. Absolutely. So what happened inside of you when you saw JP's kindness in offering you a ride? Mm. I guess a, a feeling of surprise, or, or I guess the word that actually came up before surprise was shock. And what's that feel like inside your body? Mm. At this moment, I, I'm not getting anything. Well, what happens to you when something shocks you? Um, tend to um, tighten up throughout my whole body. Right. Back up, right? Mm hmm So... Even his kindness was something that was hard to trust. Yes? Yeah, wow. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and uh, to spend some time just back in that, that moment of seeing, just feeling inside of you how hard it was to believe in his kindness. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I definitely uh, did not fully trust it even as it was going. Right. And there are reasons you don't trust it. And all of them are valid reasons. I mean, we have feelings like that in our system to protect us. And then there also comes a place where they are so reflexive, we don't even know they're happening. But those, those they become reactions. And... And reactions happen because of some level of trauma, whether it's physical or emotional or spiritual or intuitive. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it's a good thing to notice and, and continuing with following the dreams will begin to open that up. Absolutely. And that's what our dreams can do for us is, um, I'd say, I, I just... I have a sense of, and everything's a continuum, so, you know, a sense of actually belonging in the world that is different than I have felt for the first you know, five decades of my life. So, um, and 
and it's just been by being willing to be a student of the dream that's made a, a, a huge difference in my life. Cool. And it's also, and it is difficult when we read our own dreams because we go, oh, okay, yeah, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I noticed. Okay, well, that was a stupid dream or that was a scary dream. Or, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, what do you notice? Uh, just, you know, I put it aside and really hadn't done anything else with it. It's like, yeah, it's there. I haven't deleted deleted what I wrote down, but not not willing to sit with it and look at it. Yeah, and and you still could just go back to that those moments and feel that fear and feel the support and even if you did it for, you know, 20 seconds a few times a day, your dreams will begin to change. Mm. So f for our, our listening audience who, um, you know, uh, other than just writing down a dream, um, what might you suggest they do to uh, use their dreams to their advantage? Um, I think it's a great question. Um, and just because I, I have the understanding of egos that I have, it, I think it can be difficult for us to work our own dreams because, I mean, I find even even today after years of doing, I mean, I, a couple of decades with the dream journals that my ego will go, just skip over that part. Don't read that part. <laughs> I mean, so reading, you know, reading our dreams really carefully, after writing them down makes a difference because there will be details that will come as we write that if you just talk about them, don't happen mm -hmm. and um, you know going to the things that happen in the dream and just allowing allowing time to slow down and really see what's happening inside our body when an event happens you know just like you said it was hard for you to go back and feel what happened in that moment of the shock because it is hard we tend to ignore those things because we get more focused on, okay, moving on. Yep. Um, what do I have to do in the, in the physical reality? Exactly. I think I need another cup of coffee. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So, and that, that's why it, you know, there is from my place, there's a lot of benefit in working with someone else who has a much more objective view of what's happening in our, happening in our dreams. Absolutely. And uh, go ahead and uh, ask this question right now. How can how can people get a hold of you if they want to, uh, you know, work with you and, and have you help them with their dreams? Um, I have a website in process called DreamJourneysWithLee.com, um, and my uh, my email is JourneyWithLee L E I G H at AOL dot com. Okay, perfect. We'll uh, definitely put put those in the show notes. Um, but uh, Claude, anything else before we get into our wrap ups? No, no. I, I was uh, I was enjoying sitting in on your uh, little little session. So I've <laughs> I've got <laughs> I've got nothing else to contribute. Not not sure if I actually did contribute today, but <laughs> um, I would suggest no, no, you did. No, I always do, man. You know me. I get my uh, get my fingers and everything. Um, that didn't sound good. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> just draw it. So, <laughs> right. Sorry, JP. Um, so, um, yeah, I think wrap ups are good because I'm just going to keep digging this hole. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so, Lee, if you had to rescue three books from a fire, uh, what books would they be? Uh, it, I have to go back to books that I give away over and over again. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Even better. Yeah, and so maybe they wouldn't be the ones I'd rescue from a fire, but um, one is Behaving as if the God in All Life Mattered. Uh, and I just found her, and it is her story of how she came to be who she is and what she does. Um, okay, and do you know the author offhand? In the second, this second, no. Okay. Um, she's written, yeah. She she has a, a farm in Virginia called Perry Londra, where she works with the energy of the land and okay. um, 
and that she learned from all of that. I should know her name, but right at the moment, no. No problem. Um, we'll, we'll put it in the yeah, show notes. But, yeah, the second one. Sorry, it looks I, like it's Mikhail S. Wright. Michelle? Um, yeah, I think it's Michelle. Yeah, Michelle, that's yes. it. It's Michelle, right. interesting. Yes, yeah, Michelle, yeah. Mac Hale, yeah, Michelle. Anyway, I will put it in the show notes, yeah. Um, it's a book by Pema Chodron. I think it's When Life Falls Apart is the title of it. Mm -hmm. And it saved my life when my life was falling apart. And I've, I've probably, I've given a lot of copies of that book away. And I think another one that's a little more lighthearted is Love Poems from God. It's just uh, mystics from lots of centuries who have written to and about their version of the divine. Beautiful. Awesome. Cool. Um, uh, so <laughs> uh, I will just skip that portion of it and ask, what is your definition of the optimum human? Uh, at this place in my life today, I would I would go with kind of one of the founding journeys principles of, of someone who is really interested in exploring uh, that we are I am ESP, which is intuitive, mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical beings, and learning how expansive we really are as humans, that we're so much more than, you know, something walking around in a skin suit. Um, so I think that's where I would go with that one. Beautiful. And uh, who would you want to hear on this podcast and what would you want to ask them or hear them talk about? I'd be really curious if you could get the Dalai Lama on. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'd be willing to hear him talk about anything, actually. Uh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, I wonder what his Skype is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dali dot Lama. Probably. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Cool. Well, uh, I guess I'll, I'll ask this. Do you have any uh, parting words of wisdom or parting asks of our audience? Well, I appreciate that. Um, I think we're here all to be on a journey and it's to discover really the, the beauty of what's here and, and the grace that's there for us when we start to step into the flow of life. And that's not an easy journey, I know, because I've been on it. Still I'm on it. But, but I, believe, I believe as humans we have a lot of gifts when we discover. It's a good journey to be on. Yeah, to just let it happen, to, yeah. to stop fighting with it. Yeah, it certainly beats the alternative, or, or it, well. So, so I would I imagine. Tell, yeah, yeah. Right. Cool. Well, Lee, uh, I this has been amazing. I, I'm so so grateful that uh, you were able to come on today. Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. I appreciate you guys. Glad, absolutely. We appreciate you too. Wow. Um. I think I think that's it. So we've already got your uh, your info. Your um, when, when's your website going to be up? Oh, it's up and running. It's oh, it's up. up. It's up. It's just pretty simple at this okay. point. Cool. Well, simple can be beautiful. It I'll go with is. that. I like that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, Claude, I, I have one quick question for you, sir. Oh, Do you feel more comforted or more disturbed after this episode? I think I'm comforted, man. I'm always comforted. Yeah, I, good, good. Yeah, okay. you, you feel me talking less? That means I'm <laughs> comforted. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, I, I think that means that uh, that you started disturbed. Maybe. <laughs> I think people would, yeah, <laughs> describe me as such. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. <laughs> uh, I, I believe it, it goes, uh, we, we disturb the comforted and comfort the disturbed, right, Lee? Right. <laughs> Beautiful. Exactly. I'm down with the sickness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lee, thank you so much again, and uh, we look forward to uh, speaking with you again soon. That sounds great. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciated it and enjoyed it.
Beautiful. Thank you. I did too. All right. Have a good day, you guys. You too. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Yep. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Optimum Human Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to head on over to iTunes and give a five-star rating and review, which will help spread the word to more awesome listeners just like you. Head on over to TheOptimumHuman.com and subscribe to the free newsletter and get The Optimum Human's Blueprint to the Optimum Life downloaded instantly. Thanks for listening.